Hi everyone and welcome to DevNet Create. My name is Todd Nightingale. I look after the enterprise networking and cloud group here at Cisco. And I'm so excited to be here at Dev DevNet Create. I love this event. It's such an incredibly important event for Cisco. It's an event purely focused on developers and truly driving an API first strategy, driving an automation strategy, driving the entire company and the entire industry towards a really agile solution in an agile way to react to our customers and our users' needs, an agile way to drive all of our organizations towards that cloud transformation uh, that's so important. I want to thank everyone here for coming because you have made DevNet such an amazing organization, such a powerful force in the industry and at Cisco. I was lucky enough to be at the very first DevNet Create five years ago. I don't think any of us would have believed what DevNet has become, what a powerful organization, what a, what a really sophisticated and, and significant force DevNet is driving all of IT towards a more automated, uh, towards a more automated system and really driving towards this cloud transformation, full stack observability and a full API first strategy. So thank you all for everything you do. Even in the few years I've been at Cisco, I've seen this massive transformation from networks that were fully orchestrated through CLI towards a dashboard first motion, and now finally to an API first motion, a developer first motion. I believe that that transformation towards a fully automated, fully agile uh, infrastructure is critically important. And this is the organization that's really making it happen. That's really driving that developer first strategy. And in order to do that, Cisco has brought in a true expert in developer organizations and developer communities, and that's Grace Francisco. She has a phenomenal background leading these types of developer communities from Microsoft to Roblox, and she is just a passionate, passionate leader and a passionate advocate for developers. I'm so excited to have her here at Cisco and so excited to have her leading DevNet, and it's with great honor that I introduce her here to the stage of DevNet Create for the very first time. Grace Francisco, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Todd. Hi, I'm Grace Francisco. I am originally from San Francisco. So coming to work for Cisco, it was always meant to be. It's an honor to be here hosting this event. I wish I could see all of you right now, but I can't wait to meet you all in person soon enough. As Todd said, I've been very fortunate to have a diverse and rich set of experiences in developer relations. I started as a software developer way back when at IBM. And at that time, I was actually working my way through college. It was a 10-year journey for me. And like many of you, I was actually learning various scripting and programming languages on the job. Later, I eventually landed my first developer evangelist role at Microsoft, where I spent many years learning the craft of developer relations. I took those experiences and led new developer programs and teams at a variety of companies across small business, fintech, enterprise, and even gaming. Coming to Cisco has been a great opportunity for me to bring together many of my learnings and apply them here. Because at the essence of all of my work and my passion, it's always been about the community and enabling you with the tools, platforms, and programs you need to be successful at work and beyond. And that's why I'm so excited to be here with you at DevNet Create because I get to connect with the tech community of today and the future, bridging the world of infrastructure engineers and software developers. This is the nexus between hardware and software. It's this community that is tackling the problems encountered by IT and the application development happening across lines of businesses. It's all of us together that are supporting new innovations and creating new capabilities. It's this group that will advance what's to come in tech. You are the authors of that future. What's great about our community is that it's not homogenous. The DevNet community represents a group as diverse as the technologies we all support with skills that range from automation to application development. And that's why I like to think of this group as a continuum of technologists. This community has range and depth we are the builders, the innovators, the creators. We support the future of IT from the ground up, from hardware to the cloud. So whether you are working in a data center in San Jose installing new equipment, 
are up in the cloud building new applications. We are thrilled you are with us and we welcome you to our community of technologists. And wow, has this group been busy in the last 12 months? We witnessed the effects of a global pandemic in almost all aspects of life, from classrooms to grocery stores, from doctor's offices to living rooms, and running across it all, new demands on technologists. Since the last DevNet Create, it's been an unprecedented time of challenge. We saw the opportunity to save the day with technology and innovation. There was no waiting in this group for someone else to solve problems. You are a community of change agents. In the past year, you made the world a better place by helping manage the worldwide migration of people from the real world to the virtual world. You've produced and supported the solutions that made virtual learning possible, that made telemedicine scalable, and made contactless delivery of goods and services a reality. I think it's only fitting that at DevNet Create, we can highlight some of the change agents of our community that have created solutions and innovations for problems both big and small. First, glad to recognize Mark Colella, an account manager here at Cisco and a member of our community. Mark saw that people with disabilities who live on their own were having a harder time getting support during the pandemic. So Mark applied his creativity and built a new app integrated with WebEx and Meraki sensors to create a connected health solution. It allowed for individualized and inclusive care, which could detect and notify caregivers about conditions such as the faucet or the stove being left on. Alerts and communications were managed via WebEx with both family members and care providers offering care reminders and support scheduling, alerts, and emergency outreach. Amazing work here, Mark. Thank you. This is a true example of how technology can provide meaningful support and individualized care. Next up, I'm glad we can highlight Sulab Agrawal, who helped take the stress out of finding and scheduling COVID vaccinations in India. The challenge Sulab saw through his own personal situation was his parents struggling to schedule vaccinations. Sulab is a network engineer at Cisco who applied skills he learned with DevNet to solve this problem. He built a new web application, COVIDnet, which incorporates bot functionality, COVID APIs provided by India, and he created a visual way for users to identify available vaccines in their area week by week. Congratulations, Isula, for reducing the friction of scheduling COVID vaccinations. And there are even more examples of innovation this last year, some very close to home for us. Really excited to highlight Justin Leinbach, who works with our DevNet Sandbox team. See, even DevNet was impacted with challenges associated with remote work. Some of our sandboxes required resetting physical routers manually. This, of course, was a challenge with access to data center equipment as we had limitations associated with COVID protocols. But Justin creatively solved this problem. He built and connected Raspberry Pi microcontrollers to a router with a servo motor to control the server reset buttons and power supplies, then created a script to support remote access. The best part of this creation, microcontrollers don't need to be six feet apart. It's a great workaround while still preserving on-site safety. Thank you, Justin. And this group of innovators includes our partner creators too. This one from Honeywell. The pandemic brought with it many changes, including adjustments associated with hybrid work and space planning for frequently changing occupancy rates. This made the need for smarter buildings only more vital. Companies need workspaces that can adjust to the needs of a team and learn about how a given space is utilized. Honeywell, working with Cisco, was able to do just that, joining together their own technology with DNA Spaces, iOS XC, Cat9 case switches, and innovative room sensors. What's more, Honeywell and Cisco did this exploration in a virtual hackathon held during the pandemic. Another great example of how we all made that shift to new ways of engaging, collaborating, and building together, even when we are apart. Innovation couldn't be sidelined by COVID. And these are just some of the stories we've heard in the last year from you. Your creations, your experiments, it's been amazing to witness all the great things you've been able to accomplish in a time of sudden and dramatic change. 
As we've been adjusting and adapting in the last year, so has the way we've used technology. This sudden groundswell of new technology and innovation has produced immense opportunities. The vastness of this is a result of the reach of technology. It spans now all aspects of our world, from our homes with smart ovens and Wi-Fi lights, to the office with smart buildings, room sensors, and connectivity, to our human bodies, the ability to track data on our own health, and to have virtual assistants supporting us day to day. And it's not just that tech is everywhere. The access here has been democratized and all of you are enabled to customize these platforms and technologies that surround us. It seems only apt that at DevNet Create, we can discuss how there are so many more things we can design, build, and deploy. And with this ability to be creative, we encourage you to lean into this change, to lead it. This group is often defined by the problems we solve, by the innovations we create, now is the time for our community to turn these new opportunities and possibilities into capabilities. Welcome, all of you technologists, innovators, and problem solvers. Welcome to DevNet Create. Over the next two days, you'll be learning about topics like deploying applications at the edge, using network cameras to monitor buildings for social distancing, building customer-driven SDKs and APIs, and so much more in over 100 technical and strategy sessions. But right now, I want to shift the focus from what we've done to what we'll be doing, a glimpse into three technologies that will define much of the work we'll do together in the years ahead. App security, infrastructure as code, and full stack observability. For each of these, we have a special guest to talk about why these areas have growing importance to you and our broader community. We start with security because it's the foundation of everything today. Our jobs depend on making networks and applications secure. In Cisco's 2020 Future of Secure Remote Work report, 85% of organizations said that cybersecurity is extremely important or more important than before COVID-19. And 48% of survey respondents feel they are unable to effectively protect their data today. And the main reason is that they can't figure out what companies are doing with their data. As developers, that means you have to understand not only how your apps are handling and passing data, but you need to be transparent with your users about that. Above all, the future needs to be a secure one. That's why I'm so excited to bring on our first guest, Carlos Pereira, a Cisco fellow with our Emerging Technologies and Incubation Group. Carlos, can you share with our audience today what new innovations and tools can support application developers and DevSecOps engineers? Hey, Grace. Thanks a lot for having me here. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be again with the DevNet community and to address the question that we just asked. How is Cisco supporting application developers through DevSecOps? So there are some concepts that I want to highlight to you and to everybody in this community that's interesting for us to keep in mind before you actually go in more details on this. Many years ago, when DevOps started to become mainstream and the motions start to happen and more and more adoption of the DevOps and CI CD pipelines become part of every day's companies, there was a motion that starts to happen in the industry right after that is called shift left. What is this? It's pretty much security had a lot of controls and compliance motions that sometimes went against the own motion of DevOps in order to automate through code, new builds, pipelines, Git repos and stuff like this. So you had a motion that automates all the cloud native and microservices kind of agility for applications, while security was kind of on a different ballpark. So what shift left actually meant is actually bring security as part of the DevOps initiatives. And that's where DevSecOps started. So if you look at this, it like puts security in the middle of DevOps as the acronym shows. Well, if you look from that angle, it pretty much brings security inside the developer environment, as I have on that slide. 
but it also applies to runtime. What I mean by this is when you have a microservices based application running on a container environment and like Kubernetes, if it runs on bare metal servers or runs on public cloud instance or even inside virtual machines, there is all the security that applies to their runtime environment to check vulnerabilities for libraries. Let's say you're running on a JVM which is inside a container, you still need to make sure that all the code and the libraries that that developer is consuming for that particular application services are not vulnerable. They are up to the latest and greatest on the security measures and, and code when updated against any sort of vulnerability and all the patches are applied. So the shift left granted the runtime and developer environment of security being part of the automation that DevOps brings to companies. However, as we evolve more of this and DevOps became mainstream, there is a new aspect that is start to happen with Cisco is bringing to the market is the notion of security of applications from the lens of APIs. So APIs are pretty much how we communicate for any application that is built in these days, even further as they are built as cloud native. So you have internal APIs that allow the communication amongst multiple microservices that build a cloud native app as a construct and as a deliverable, and they are part of how you consume services from a development pipeline with tools like CI, CD, and others. But also there are external APIs that are part of any applications those days. So many apps when you build, they request login using external entities like your Gmail, Facebook account, and stuff like this. So external APIs are reality or any app today, in particular SaaS services. Internal APIs is how you consume between microservices and cloud native apps. So it's it's obvious to start to think that from an app security perspective, there is a motion, there is a shift left from an API's perspective, how we can make this part of the game. Because APIs and abuse of so will be more than an infrequent kind of event to more of a frequent attack vector as cloud native becomes mainstream. And what the challenges with APIs as you look at this is not all of the applications have their open API specs available. If you have a legacy application that you need to communicate to, or you need an external services that you just consume, the external company that's providing the services to you, they're not going to inform you when they change something on their code that actually makes modifications on their API. They're just going to do it. And you have the notion of what is the design of the APIs for consumption of your app, or what you bring for the external people that is actually running your app or consuming your services versus what is the actual runtime API landscape of your app. So there are differences over time as you actually bring new code yourself. But there are concepts like zombie APIs, which are APIs that got deprecated over time that people believe that are no longer available, no longer running, but an attacker can still access it because it's still there. There are undocumented APIs, which is called shadow APIs which is sometimes happens because people don't have a full automated documentation on what is your application's API landscape because they don't have an open API spec as part of the whole package. And that may generate changes on as you evolve your own code, your own CI, CD pipelines and automate that code. And it can break your application, as I mentioned before, does having an open API spec without instrumenting the code is very hard if you don't have visibility on what is happening. So Cisco is bringing API clarity to the open source is an initiative that it is driving as part of the API security inside Cisco, which is pretty much based on the concept that knowing the API spec of your application is the first step to identify your API risk. I can actually secure what I can not see, so the API clarity.io is an open source project that we are working very close with the community, including DevNet leading the way here. When you having the visibility of your API specs across your application, then you can run fuzzing tests from the developer's perspective and match this with analysis from the security standpoint and other advantage that you have. So the architecture from a high level is very simple. You're running a Kubernetes cluster. By the time you have all your pods that comply the microservices of your applications, 
we, as part of the API clarity, we make together with the Kubernetes cluster installation, we add the invoice proxies and the Istio services mesh around this. So there is no code change or no instrumentation that needs to happen at the code. We capture and mirror all the API traffic from the proxies and send to the open API spec engine within API clarity. And from there, you can see what are your internal API mapping, your external API mapping, and what's the diff between either internal and external APIs over time. So you have the full API spec being generated as people consume your app. So for that, we did an integration with GitLab, which is a very popular CI CD framework out there. And we did that integration with, between the open source API Clarity in GitLab. And for that, we have a demo right there. Can you please roll the demo? In this demonstration, we are showing how API Clarity can be automatically built and deployed in GitLab as part of a cloud native application and allow us visibility into how individual services are interacting with each other via API. What we see here is the source repository for a demo retail application that sells socks. This application is comprised of several services, such as catalog display, user and cart management, and payment processing. Just like with any CI CD pipeline, an update to the source should trigger a phase of build, test, and deployment processes. For brevity, we will build and deploy in this instance. Let's trigger the pipeline by making a simple change to the readme file. Once we commit our change in the repository, GitLab will trigger the pipeline definition and the GitLab runner will follow the instructions in the gitlab-ci.yaml file. The first step in this is to provision our Kubernetes cluster and layer on Istio service mesh and Helm package management. The former is needed for API clarity to consume insights to the inner workings of services in the cluster, and the latter is to allow us to automatically deploy our application. Once our cluster is provisioned and Istio is installed and gateways configured, our application services can now be deployed, including API Clarity. After all services are spun up, we can navigate to our sock shop and browse our catalog. Immediately in API Clarity, we will see interactions between services being tracked and even specific endpoints that were pinged in the resulting health of those API calls. As you saw, the, the demo that's just run of the integration between API Clarity and GitLab open source that was done with our DevNet engineering working straight with their team. So Grace, hope it now clarifies your initial question. There is a lot that Cisco is doing to your first point around app security, in particular with API security in the open source. And I asked, the, all the DevNet community to go and jump on that, contribute to that initiative and in open source, and let's make the world more secure together. Thank you very much. Back to you, Grace. Thanks, Carlos. It's great to see API Clarity in action with GitLab and how it can support the work you're all doing in securing applications, especially as we look to move to a future powered by infrastructure as code. And to discuss that subject, I'd like to welcome a special guest. Armin Datgar, CTO and co-founder of HashiCorp. Back in March of this year, HashiCorp and Cisco announced a partnership to help support our infrastructure as code efforts. We've since released offers such as the Intersight service for HashiCorp Terraform, as well as the Intersight Kubernetes service. Armin, thanks for joining us today. It would be great to hear about the capabilities we can now provide our community, as well as where you see an expansion of capabilities in the future. What new things can our two organizations do together? Cool. Thanks so much, Grace. Uh, really excited to be here and ch chat a little bit more about infrastructure as code and, and sort of what all we can be doing together. Yeah, you know, I think to give people just a sense of context, when we started on working tools like Terraform and thinking about infrastructure as code, it was originally born sort of to solve a cloud problem, right? And what, we, what I mean by that is when we think about cloud infrastructure, it really is API driven. So when you think about what the hallmarks of modern IaaS are, and so the challenge was, how do you take this highly API-driven type of infrastructure and make it usable, make it manageable at scale for developers? And I think that's really what infrastructure as code's sort of strong suit is, right? Is allowing us to define this declarative definition, allow Terraform to figure out what do we need to create or modify or destroy to converge the infrastructure into what we need it to be. 
And so it sort of started out life there based on sort of the challenges of sort of a cloud IaaS. But I think from there, we sort of saw the possibilities of how do you apply this concept? How do you apply the benefits of infrastructure as code much more broadly? Uh, and so I think for us that, you know, partnership with Cisco is a really natural and obvious one, which is what we're starting to see is how do we bring some of these cloud native practices into our physical data centers, into our private data centers and apply the same practices there. So I think Cisco being a logical partner and Intersight being a logical gateway in terms of how do we start to think about that hybrid cloud management, where we started maybe with a cloud approach or philosophy, but now realizing it has this broad applicability. So what I'm excited about there is through the Intersight service and the integration with Terraform, we're now bringing that sort of capability of, hey, I can define this stuff as code, integrate it in my version control system, have sort of this development life cycle around how I manage and codify my infrastructure. And that can now be applied from everything from my very low level hardware devices on-prem through to my infrastructure as a service on-prem through to my cloud infrastructure as service. And then I think when we start transitioning and talking about where do we go from here, right? Like what's the sort of evolution of this? Is it just infrastructure as a service, you know, now on-prem as well as cloud. And I think, you know, our Intersight partnership really enables some of that hybrid use case. I think what's exciting to me is looking at where we're now taking infrastructure's code and where it's being applied. And so I think particularly that starts to be upstack, whether we talk about platform as a service or you go up and you talk about software as a service. And so I think what's kind of counterintuitive is people think about, hey, if I'm in a PaaS or I'm in a software as a service, there isn't infrastructure to manage. Why do I need to think about sort of an infrastructure management tool or an infrastructure as code tool? But I think what's interesting is even if you take a PaaS like Kubernetes, there's a ton of objects and resources to manage, right? For each tenant, I want to define different namespaces, different resources, different applications that are running on top of it. An app might be composed of you know, dozens of different moving pieces. And those apps are also composed with other things, you know, databases, caches, messaging systems that live outside of the core platform as a service. So tools like Terraform start to let you compose all of that different infrastructure together or I might have a modern Kubernetes-based app that I'm defining and defining on top of the platform, but it's consuming a database that from sort of an IaaS vendor. It might be supported by a hardware load balancer or firewall, so I can bring all of those configurations together. And then when we go even higher level and we think about software as a service, you know, a great example is you know, the integrations with AppD, right? And so when we think about sort of the app dynamics capabilities, not only can I deploy my application, but then can I define what are the dashboards I want to use to monitor that application? What are the alerts I want to define? The thresholds upon which I get notified? And so I might define that in AppD, which is providing my sort of APM and observability, and then connect that out to you know, pager duty as an example to get notified and paged in the middle of the night if something goes wrong. So it's really thinking about that full stack of what are all the supporting pieces for that application, some of it's IaaS, some of it's platform as a service, some of it's increasingly software as a service, and bringing all those to manage in a kind of consistent way, driven as code, you know, that the developers can kind of define and manage in a self-service way. And so I think when we think about, you know, you know, on the very extremes, you know, one of my favorite providers is someone created a Domino's provider, right? So you might even say, great, I deploy my app, and then I celebrate by ordering pizza through Domino's, and I can do all of that as infrastructure as code. So that to me kind of speaks to the, the variety and kind of the future of where we're going with this. Now, I think once we've made this transition to infrastructure as code, I think it unlocks the next level of what we can work on, which is how do we start to shift left a bunch of these controls, whether they're security controls. And now because we have this codified definition, we can look for, hey, do I have an out of date image? Have I misconfigured the system? Is there a vulnerability in how it's defined? All of those kind of security controls we can do through static analysis and code analysis because we have this definition. But we can also bring in things like cost management and optimization as well, right? So we can look at it and say, hey, you've defined these extra large VMs. You're really not using that much capacity. You could resize them to smalls and save X dollars a month, right? And not impact sort of application quality of service. And those things become possible because we have this codification. We have this sort of automation. I think that becomes kind of the future of where this stuff goes, right? After we get to the sort of the foundational automation pieces, right? So I'm super excited. You know, I think there's a lot here in terms of, you know, what can we start to solve right away in terms of just basic automation? How do we get to that end-to-end -end vision 
of all the different components being automated? And then how do you layer on top of that automation with sort of the future of optimization, whether it's cost security or other facets of it? So a lot here, very excited about it and uh, excited to be here, Grace. So with that, let me hand it back over to the Cisco team. I know they've actually put together a demo uh, so we can see what this actually looks like you know, in an end-to-end -end scenario.